Two months after the end of the Persian Gulf War, another nation celebrated the 30th anniversary of the defeat of another invasionary force. Cubans marked the Bay of Pigs invasion Friday, some fearful of another invasion. And Cuban President Fidel Castro took advantage of that occasion to talk about the future of socialism on that island. Cuba Vision reports. This week, Cuba celebrated the 30th anniversary of the victory over the Cuban exiles that were organized, trained and armed for months by the U.S. governments of Eisenhower and Kennedy to invade this island. They did so in April of 1961 by attacking and trying to enter Cuba through the Bay of Pigs. The fighting lasted 64 hours and the Cuban revolutionary troops totally defeated the invaders. 30 years later, Cuban President Fidel Castro met with his ex-soldiers who made up his troops in those days, relatives of those who fell, and members of the Cuban Communist Party. The meeting was broadcast live on television to all of the country. Castro centered most of his speech on the economic difficulties the island was facing as a result of the crumbling of the former socialist camp, with which Cuba had been carrying out 85% of its foreign business. He said that the worst danger that Cuba could face now is the disintegration of the Soviet Union. How the situation in the USSR evolves will have a tremendous importance on our own future situation, said Castro. After praising the Soviet government for doing everything possible to comply with their delivery commitments of merchandise to Cuba, including fuel and food, the Cuban president said that it is very much in his country's interest to see the situation inside the Soviet Union improve. Our relations are friendly, he added. We respect their reforms. We have our opinions, but we have no right to meddle into their internal affairs. A worsening of the situation in the Soviet Union will be bad not only for us, but for the whole world. Fidel Castro said that Cuba would fight to the end to defend the principles of socialism. If 30 years ago we only had old weapons and we were able to defeat the enemy in less than three days, it would take us much, much less now to defeat them again. We can resist and we can win, he added. He concluded by saying that the Cuban Revolution would not be dogmatic, but that no concession would be made to those who want to get rid of socialism in Cuba. We will have no capitalist economy here, but one which will be planned, programmed. In Havana and from Cuba Vision, Gilberto Caballero reporting for the CNN World Report. Around 5,000 athletes from 39 countries have marched into Havana in the kind of invasion Fidel Castro's government welcomed with open arms. But reviews are mixed for both Cuba and the U.S. governments as Havana hosts the 16-day Pan American Games. The cash short Cubans have built 21 new installations for the games. From a new open-air gym, to renovated tennis courts, Cuba invested heavily in time and prestige. The diving facility swimming pool here in Cuba rivals anything in the United States. We didn't quite expect the tank to be so dark on the bottom, so that makes it a little bit harder to see body positions and stuff when you're correcting. But other than that, it's everything that we expected. But Cuba's disintegrating economy is reflected in many of the game's preparations. Leaking pipes, bare wires, hastily poured cement. Depending on what you think the real value of the Cuban peso is, Cuba spent anywhere from 39 to 156 million dollars on these games. Either way, it could be more than this island of rationing and shortages may be able to afford. Some of the athletes have even run into problems with food. Salad, you know, salad and fruit, something like that. Because we, we can't find it out. fruit. But faced with the collapse of socialist trade and aid partners, Cuba considers it a miracle the games are here at all. This veteran Cuban javelin thrower says she has experience in four previous Pan American Games. She says she thinks the difficulties the Cubans have had in hosting the games have been overcome. She says it's a victory for all Cubans, for everyone on the island. 
Before they were allowed to arrive in Cuba, U.S. athletes faced stern warnings from the U.S. State Department. The State Department told us not to take any kind of packages out of Cuba on behalf of a Cuban friend you may have met, not to uh, deal in the black market, not to get involved in political conversations, and uh, to stay off the beaches at night. Cuba's security apparatus is out in force to prevent dissidents from... It is a bastion of communism in a world that treats Lenin like a bad habit successfully broken. David Smith went to Cuba to find out how it's coping and found it remarkably robust. It's 90 degrees in the shade. And in the heat of the afternoon, a brigade of conscripted workers from Havana are trying to salvage what's left of Cuba's most valuable commodity, sugarcane. Already they're a month behind. And there's no way now that they can bring in all this harvest. Man cannot compete with machines. The tragedy for Cuba is that they have the machines. Combine harvesters are plenty, but no petrol to run them. As a result, Fidel Castro's revolution has stalled. His people have been mobilized as if for war. Violeta Dominguez is the nurse attached to this brigade of workers. Like most, she's never done this kind of hard labor before. Voices like that are still rare in Cuba. But visit the old port of Havana, once the gateway to Latin America for the Spanish conquistadores, and you sense how serious this crisis is. For a start, you don't see this much anymore. A Russian tanker sweeping through the harbor loaded with Siberian crude oil. Two years ago, the Soviets supplied Fidel Castro with 13 million tons of oil. This year, it'll be 2 million. It's an energy crisis that translates into shortages and cutbacks in everyday life. So, for example, public transport in Havana has been cut by 50%. So virtually everything now is rationed, with every adult having a prescribed diet that guarantees so many calories a day and no more. So the Communist Party newspaper, Grandma, circulation last year half a million, is now printed in limited edition, posted up in kiosks. So this is an economy and a country effectively under siege, alone and isolated. Its commitment to socialism and the revolution threatened as never before. Yet Fidel Castro and his Communist Party are not abandoning the principles they've lived by ever since they came to power 33 years ago. And those in the West who predicted that Castro's Cuba would collapse just as the Soviet Union had done are now having to acknowledge that his leadership is proving far more durable and adaptable than they'd ever imagined. The leader makes few public appearances, and when he does, they tend to make a statement. None more so than this past May Day. Revolution Square was packed to overflowing. More than a million Cubans, that's a tenth of the population, celebrating the revolution and all its works, to the delight of Fidel Castro. Pedal power is back in fashion here, because bikes are having to replace cars. So the military cycled on parade. <laughs> Has the collapse of the Soviet Union made you question socialism? No. On the other hand, uh, I, uh, no, no, quite the contrary. We believe that uh, socialism is the only way uh, for developing countries. We believe it's the only way for all countries, but certainly for developing countries, uh, in the sense that developing countries, uh, and especially Cuba, is uh, practically devoid of... Uh, great resources, mineral or otherwise. How long do you think that your people can put up with this state of emergency? <laughs> I would say forever. Why? Well, well the Cubans, like the uh, Britons, are a very proud people and proud of their independence. Uh, well, you are, uh, I remember during the Second World War, uh, the British people were very steadfast in the face of Nazi aggression. So are we. Rhetoric may be, but what Fidel Castro gave Cuba 33 years ago was independence. A sense of nationhood it had never had before. And wherever he goes now, here he was celebrating the potato harvest the other day. 
He presents himself as a nationalist first, a socialist second. La batalla de la papa. When he calls the battle for the potato, an heroic struggle, nobody doubts him or the sentiment. It's all perceived by his people as part of the wider battle, for survival in the face of America's hostility and economic blockade. So much as people queue for absolutely everything. This was the line outside a cafe in Havana one morning last week. Their anger is directed not at Castro, but at the Americans. Cubans do mind their words very carefully when talking to foreigners. But still, there was no mistaking where the loyalties of these people lay. The question then is not how long Castro will survive. The issue we learned is how and why he's retained control during these past few months. Perhaps you find the answer best in the interior of the island, the Campo, the countryside where the vast majority of Cubans live. The town of Huynes is returning to the pre-industrial age. The horse and cart are back. Bread is baked once a day with no extras for anyone. It's all part of what Fidel Castro calls his zero option. Preparing for the day when Cuba has no oil whatsoever and has to survive on its own. Out on the collective farms, it's an extraordinary sight to behold. Biblical almost in its simplicity, tragic in its intensity. They're sending oxen back into the fields to plough. Only problem is it takes six months, by all accounts, to train them to do the job. Senor de Vila is a full-time official for the Communist Party here. Uh, was life better one or two years ago? Claro, teníamos un mayor un mejor nivel de vida porque porque nosotros independientemente de tener las cosas necesarias, si lo deseábamos, podíamos comprar otras cosas. No sé, eh, por ponerte un ejemplo, podíamos comprar jugo, eh, productos cárnicos, productos lácteos, extra. Whatever the hardships though, Cuba can still pride itself on a system of health, education and welfare that is second to none in Latin America. This is a clinic in Juanes. Under the eye of Che Guevara, a doctor himself who joined Castro's revolution in the 1950s. There are no shortages. There's one doctor for every 120 families. An infant mortality rate that compares with the first world. And while much of Latin America can't eradicate cholera, Cuba hasn't had cholera for years. Cada día se, se incrementan esa, esas actividades en nuestro país. Y el ánimo nuestro es mantener a, a nuestra población sana y el que esté enfermo, tratarlo de curar. Que se convierte en un animal. At the high school, it's another story of the third world creating first world conditions. Cuba's literacy rate is practically 100%. No one leaves until they're 17. And last year, more than 80% went on to higher education, technical school or university. If it seems like high idealism, then it is. But what makes it truly progressive is that teachers like Felix Merero feel they can criticize the system, not just praise it. Todo sistema nuevo tiene sus errores. Usted estudió en su error también. Cuando se informa, eh, sí, cuando se instaló el capitalismo en Inglaterra, hubo su error. Eh, como ellos nos ha dado derecho a la vida, eh, como ellos nos ha dado la posibilidad de estudiar al negro, al blanco, al campesino, etcétera, etcétera. Yo mismo soy negro, yo, tengo, yo, la, yo soy licenciado. This is a cradle to grave mentality then. And so far, unlike the Soviet Union, central planning and state provision have worked. Castro and the Communist Party have managed to keep the system intact. Yet necessity is the mother of invention. And in Cuba, the specter of Fidel's zero option has concentrated minds rapidly. Because not just the Cuban government and the Communist Party here, 
would have the world believe that they can survive and succeed where the Soviets and so many others failed. Privately, their leaders acknowledge that the country cannot live this way forever. And that helps explain why, since the beginning of this year, Fidel Castro has been making overtures to the United States about a new relationship and an end to the American blockade of his country. No country on Earth symbolized the Cold War more than Cuba. The missile crisis of 1962, when the Soviets and the Americans so nearly went nuclear over the stationing of Russian warheads on the island, is remembered here by this rather stark tribute on the shore outside Havana. The missile crisis made Cuba strategically vital to the superpowers. The end of the Cold War makes it just another country in Latin America. No one knows that more than Castro himself. And earlier this year, he held meetings here with a high-ranking American delegation from yesteryear. Robert McNamara, Mr. President. Nice to meet you, Mr. Men like Robert McNamara, who was Kennedy's defense secretary at the time of the missile crisis. If I had been a Cuban leader, I think I might have expected a U.S. invasion. Also there was Ray Klein, deputy chief of the CIA back in 1962. What was the message that you were hearing from Fidel Castro? I think he was saying that he would like to have a close relationship with the United States. He did say, uh, now that the Russians have collapsed, there is only one unipolar power, he used that term, unipolar, and he says it's the United States, so we've got to work with the United States. It's clear from talking to the Cubans in Havana that they want an accommodation with Washington as soon as possible. Eugenio Ballari is one of the founding fathers of the Cuban Revolution, now an economist and an advisor to Fidel Castro. But realistically, America is never going to deal with Cuba as long as Fidel Castro is in power. Mr. Imperialist, we have absolutely no fear of you. So says the hoarding outside the old American embassy in Havana. Challenging America to deal with him is a gamble for Fidel Castro. Because the one thing that unites this country behind him is the American blockade. Certainly there can be few doubts about what would happen if the gates across the water did open. Because communism here has not destroyed the culture, the love of life, the sense that you live to the full today, regardless of how grim tomorrow will be. Nor has Marxist-Leninism touched something very dear to every Latin American, a private life that's nobody else's business. <laughs> to watch the Cubans at play, though, is to know that the next generation is divided about the future. There are those who feel they must be loyal to the revolution, and those that cannot wait to get out. How do you see the future of Cuba? El provechoso, un futuro luminoso, si en en buen sentido la palabra, muy luminoso porque estamos aprendiendo a trabajar con pocos recursos para salir adelante. No se puede ir. Así como va, no se puede llegar a al 2000 como dice. No se llega. Do you want to stay here? ¿Tú quieres estar aquí? No. There should be few illusions about what Castro will do if this crisis deepens. This is still a state with eyes and ears, with a secret police that tolerates free expression up to a point. Indeed, in the past few months, Cuba's handful of dissidents have been silenced or jailed. This is a revolution which sought independence and sovereignty, got independence and sovereignty for our people, and we're not about to give it away. And you're not about to remove Fidel Castro? We're not. Will you allow a true opposition to emerge in this country? Uh, no. We don't uh, allow people who oppose socialism. Why? Because for us, socialism is to independence and sovereignty. Uno, dos y tres. Bye. Bye.
Friday. It's that Cuban blend of socialism, nationalism and independence that enables Fidel Castro to defy recent history and survive while so many others have fallen. This has been communism with a difference. Marxism that respected the people, not crushed them. And Castro's enduring legacy will not be as the dictator of a client state, but the first leader of a proud, independent Cuba. Cuba's official news agency is letting the world in on a secret. It says the government has completed 30 kilometers or 20 miles of tunnels beneath Havana. The news agency says the tunnels were built in secret by hundreds of Cubans in anticipation of an aerial attack by the United States. We'll be back right after this.